Hello? Oh! Well, that, that's got your attention. That's got your attention. We're going to begin the service now. Although, actually, we seem a bit weak on this side, but congratulations for coming. <clears throat> Let us begin by welcoming God. So, shall we pray? Shall we pray, remembering what you, Father, have done for us and simply seeking your presence and your blessing? Amen. It's making a noise. Is that? Oh, it stopped. So, having welcomed the Lord, I welcome you all to this service of Holy Communion at St. Mary's. I welcome you all, young, old, near and far, on the internet, so great. The, um, the Reverend Dennis will be presiding at Communion, and Kaz, our other reader, will be talking about, we want to see Jesus. Now, today is a special day. And I'm going to say, if there's any of you of Irish descent, happy St. Patrick's Day. Does that mean anything to anybody? Right, okay, I tried. Many years ago, when I was leading a service at All Saints, I led it, and I never mentioned that it was the National Holocaust Day. And at the end of the service, a lady came to me and said, you haven't mentioned it's National Holocaust Day, which of course I hadn't realised it was. So I have to concede that ever since then, I've always tried to include whatever is happening and mentioned in the dairy diary. Right, there's an awful lot of administration before we start properly. And the first bit is Kaz, who is coming. Thank you, Shirley. It's that time of year when we, we've, we've, we've got the annual parochial church council, the APCM, annual meeting coming up. Did we know that? I've got the church warden nodding. Okay. So our annual meeting um, is on uh, Wednesday the 24th of April, date for your diary. Um, but in order to prepare for that meeting, we need to, um, in order to come to that meeting, you need to be on what we call the electoral roll, which is basically the church membership list. Um, but in preparation for the meeting, we have to close the list a few weeks before the meeting. So the electoral roll will be closing on the 1st of April, that's Easter Monday. Now, most of you will already, if you've been coming for a while, you'll already be on the electoral roll. But if you've been coming, say, in the last 12 months, I have to be honest, I've been quite remiss. Normally when people have been coming for a while, I thrust one of these forms in front of you and say, do you want to become a church member? Now I know that there's some people here this morning that aren't on the electoral roll, and if you're not, um, we would warmly invite you to um, fill the paperwork in and really it would be great if you could come to the, the annual meeting. You don't have to, but um, the annual, the uh, electoral roll forms are at the back of church behind Rachel on the balloon, the notice board just by the back of church by the children's area. Um, the electoral roll forms at the front and then at the back is an, what I call a contact sheet and it basically it's asking for your, your contact details um, and permission for us to put it on our database. Um, it also asks for your date of birth, which obviously you don't have to give, but the reason that we do that is once you get to a certain age in our church, you get a birthday present. And that's the oh, oh it also helps me with stats because once a year I have to say how many people I estimate in church are over the age of 70, and I'm not very good at it, so it really helps me. But as I say, not mandatory, but you can decide then whether you want the email sending out, whether you want to be on the text um, prayer list and, and, and such like. Um, 
If you do want to fill in these forms, they need to be back to me by the 1st of April. There is a basket at the back of church on the mobile bookcase um, which you can put them in. I really ought to have put some envelopes, didn't I, because it's confidential information. Alternatively, try and grab hold of me or give it to Ruth or somebody that can put in the office for me. I have to be honest, I'm going to be dashing today. Kids have got a party and I'm not around during the week, but I am here next Sunday. So does that all make sense to everybody? For most people, you don't need to worry about it. If you were on the electoral roll last year, you'll still be on it this year. But if you've been coming in the last 12 months and you've not signed one of these pieces of paper and would like to, grab one off the notice board if you can't find me and fill it in. Thank you. Um, as you know, we, uh, George is leaving us, and we thought about how we could um, send him some messages. And initially, we thought about a book where people could write a message to him. But I don't know if you like me, when I go anywhere, whether it's a National Trust place or anywhere where I'm signing a book, I always have a quick look what somebody else has written. <laughs> I can see several people nodding and you think, oh, that, that was something I was going to say. So Charles came up with an idea that uh, when he finished as being a GP, they did him um, a message and memory jar and there were little scrolls of paper that were tied up and then they went in the jar. So nobody else knows what you're writing. So we decided to go for that. So I'm going to put this at the back of church. I've got some um, sort of parchment type paper, some ribbons, and then you can write your message on it and then your message to George and Gail will go into a jar. So currently, um, I'll put those there, and then not got the jar yet. So you can forward it up and put it in here. The other advantage of this is, if you know a member of our church who is unable to come to church and would like to write a message or memory for George, you can give them a piece of paper and ribbon and they can be part of it. So it's for all members of the church community. So I'll put these at the back and leave them there and then you can write a memory or message to George and Gail. Thank you, Shirley. <coughs> Right, now I have an important message uh, for you all from a bishop. Okay, this is the message. The Bishop of Ramsbury is pleased to announce that he has appointed the Reverend Hazel Davis to be the pioneer team vicar half-time in the Vale of Pusey. Please pray for Hazel and her family as they prepare to move into the benefice. The details about Hazel's licensing will be confirmed in due course. Okay? So, I thought, as it's telling us to pray, shall we just have a quick prayer for Hazel and family? And so, Father, we thank you for answered prayer. And we pray for your blessing simply upon her ministry there and her time there as well, because of which not all her time is in ministry. So I just pray for blessing upon her and husband and family. Amen. And I'm sorry, Rachel, you've been waiting, but I thought you should um, listen to the message from the bishop. Uh, right, so uh, we can now uh, do a prayer for the children who will be leaving us. So shall we pray for the children? 
Father, I thank you that we have children and young people in our church. I thank and praise you for each one of them. And I pray that just as we seek that you will speak to us here in church, I pray that you will speak to them in Sunday school. And this I ask in your name. Amen. And finally, you're about to take part or experience an experiment that I am initiating. Don't worry, it's not too, too different. You may or may not have noticed that this morning we didn't have any sung worship by the song, uh, any worship by the song worship group just before the service because I go to different churches and I say, see different ways of doing things and I want to experiment with when I am leading, this is me, okay, not everybody necessarily, when I am leading, I'm experimenting with no singing from the worship group at the beginning, but three songs together, which is called block worship or the beginning of it, uh, before the confession. I'm, I'm telling you because um, I don't want you all to sit down after the second song, which of course is distinctly possible. Now, why am I doing this? Um, other churches do it, and if you have more than one song, let's say, it helps you to focus and concentrate on Jesus. And if you think about the theme today, which is we want to see Jesus, I think this will give us a, a nice opportunity to concentrate on Jesus, on these three lovely songs as we worship him. So stand if you're able to worship our God.
It's your name that brings light into the darkest places. It's your name that lights up the world. And we pray in your name that your Holy Spirit will bring anointing and blessings to throughout this service. May in your name, may your Holy Spirit minister to us, heart, mind, body, and spirit. Amen. And so we come to confession. Now, this confession reminds us that we're once spiritually dead, 
but have been forgiven through Jesus. So shall we say together, Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who once were dead, but now have life through Christ our Lord. Amen. This forgiveness comes not just as a result of our confession, but because of Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross. So we can have life through Jesus. And so the absolution. May the Father forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. In the Collect. Most merciful God, who by the death of the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and for ever. Amen. So, can we now have the first reading? Today's Bible reading is taken from Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 to 34. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with your ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant though I was husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This is the word of the Lord. If you're willing and able to stand for the gospel reading. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. There were some Greeks in town who'd come up to worship at the feast. Oh, sorry. It's right. It's just, it's the... Okay. (laughs) Greeks in town. Sorry about that. There were some Greeks in town who'd come up to worship at the feast. They approached Philip, who was from Bethsaida in, in Galilee. Sir, we want to see Jesus. Can you help us? Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip together told Jesus, and Jesus answered, Time's up. The time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Listen carefully. Unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. In the same way, anyone who holds on to life just as it, just as it is, destroys that life but if you let go reckless in your love you'll have it forever real and eternal if any of you wants to serve me then follow me then you'll be where I am ready to serve at a moment's notice the father will honor and reward anyone who serves me right now I am shaken and what am I to say father get me out of this No, that is why I came in the first place. I'll say, Father, 
put your display on your glory on display. A voice came out of the sky. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The listening crowd said, thunder. Others said, an angel spoke to him. Jesus said, the voice didn't come for me, but for you. At this moment, the world is in crisis. Now Satan, the ruler of this world, will be thrown out. And I, as I am lifted up from the earth, will attract everyone to me and gather them around me. He put it this way to show how he was going to be put to death. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may I only speak your words. May we only hear your words. And may we do all that you ask us to. Amen. A few weeks ago, Dan um, was preaching on a similar passage. I don't know if any of it rang bells with you, the, the gospel passage. Um, Dan preached on Mark's version of this, this event. Um, but he also said that a good way to get to grips with a passage of the Bible is to offer to preach on them. It focuses the brain. Um, and I must admit, I've learned a lot preparing for this morning's talk. I think I've said to you before that I often offer to talk on dates that work for me rather than look at the passages and then offer. Because to be honest, if I'd looked at this passage, I wouldn't have offered to do it. <laughs> I find it quite tricky. Um, the reason, the big reason why I don't like it is I don't like to think too much about the cross. Being honest with you, I don't want to think about the cross. Don't mind the empty cross, but not the cross with Jesus on it. I, you might know, or you might not, I grew up in Horninglow, and Sir John's church was where I was baptised, confirmed. I taught Sunday school there and went to brownies and guides. Um, if you don't know St John's, it's a very high um, Anglo-Catholic church. So I was very used to seeing crucifixes, the pictures of Jesus dying on the cross. Um, but it was a bit of a relief for me when I became a Christian, had a personal encounter with God, was baptised in the Spirit, however you want to call it. Um, I went to the university's Christian Union, which was based on very low church. And the em emphasis was very much on the empty cross. I mean, we have an empty cross here. The emphasis was on the risen Christ, not the dying Christ. And because I don't like contemplating the suffering that Jesus went through for me, if I was the only sinner on the earth, Jesus would have done that for me. In the same way as if you were the only sinner, Jesus would have done that for you. I find that quite hard to think about. And I don't like to dwell on it too much. I know each week we celebrate Jesus' death with communion. And I, but I don't tend to ponder the, on, the, the, the death bit. I concentrate on the risen Christ or the rebel Jesus who was out and about teaching as to how we should live our lives. Um, a good few years ago, uh, a house group session, we were talking about the cross and everyone was asked to imagine being at the foot of the cross and say what they felt about it. I found it very, very difficult. I think I found it impossible to do because I didn't want to be at the foot. And I might be the only one here this morning, in which case um, it's a bit of a waste of me talking. But I suspect there might be others that don't want to look at Jesus on the cross. They don't want to, we don't want to be reminded of our sin, of our need for the cross. It makes me feel bad about my behaviour. But that's where today's passage takes us. To put our passage into context... Um, Jesus and his disciples have arrived in the Jerusalem area for his last Passover celebration. His friend Lazarus is, is raised from the dead. Mary, Lazarus' sister, has washed Jesus' feet in a very expensive perfume. 
and Jesus has ridden into Jerusalem on the donkey with people waving palm branches and calling out Hosanna, which of course we'll be looking at next week. Now there were some Greeks in Jerusalem for the festivities and they, Greeks might have been Greeks, but they might have been just people that weren't Jewish. I don't know why they approached Philip. That was my first question. My go-to theologian, Tom Wright, hasn't really answered the question for me. But another preacher has said that the name Philip is a Greek name, and Bethsaida, where he came from, is near the Decapolis, which was a group of ten cities that all spoke Greek. And I've read, I can't verify it, we could talk to Dennis afterwards, um, but it, it's been suggested that the fishermen at Bethsaida needed to know how to speak Greek in order to trade with the people from Decapolis. One preacher actually speculated whether Philip knew this, the, the Greeks um, that had turned up. I, I, I honestly don't know. I'm just putting it out there as suggestions. But for me, the question as to why it was Philip they approached and why the author of the gospel found it necessary to point out where Philip was from, well, that's a question for me that I'm going to take with me to the new earth and the new heaven. Along with the other question is, why did Philip need to go and grab Andrew's hand to go and approach Jesus? Was there something scary in it that there needed to be um, Andrew going with him? I just don't know the answers to that. But the next curious thing for me is that after Jesus is told that there's some foreigners interested in, in what he's doing, um, Jesus then starts to the, talking to the disciples about seeds dying in the ground and producing big harvests. On a first look, it looks a bit like a politician's been asked a question that he doesn't like the answer to, so he answers another question. I'm kind of, where are you going with this, Jesus? But when you look at it further, I think what Jesus was saying is, okay, People from outside of the Jewish culture are now starting to be interested. That means my time has come. My time has come because Jesus' focus was always on his own death. That was the mission. The Old Testament anticipates it, the Gospels examine it, and the letters look back at it. Jesus' death is central to our scripture. Some interesting stats, well, I thought they were interesting, um, that I found about the Gospels. Only four chapters in total of the Gospels focus on Jesus' life before he was 30. Eighty-five chapters concentrate on his last three and a half years. Twenty-nine chapters are about the last week of Jesus' life. And 13 chapters focus on his last 24 hours on earth. The theme of the whole Bible is about Jesus' death. Jesus was saying that if people want to see me, he uses an, the analogy of a grain of wheat falling to the earth. It doesn't really die, but it degenerates and then produces much fruit. And that's how it was with Jesus. His one purpose on earth was to die and by doing that, he will reach far more than a few Greeks. He will reach the whole earth. Jesus then goes on to say that he's troubled and shaken about what's to come. The original word that was used was a very strong one. He's agitated, unsettled, distraught, in agony. Now, was that just the thought of the physical death that he would endure? probably part of it, because he was also aware that he was about to bear the sins of all humanity. And because of that, the real pain will be, for that moment, he will experience separation from the Father. All that intimacy which he'd experienced on earth, sorry, in heaven and then on earth, will be gone. He will be separated from God. 
Now for us, that means that the creator God will also understand our sufferings, our feelings of rejection, etc. Our God truly knows how it feels because Jesus has felt it. Jesus then goes on to talk about glorifying God. Father, glorify your name. Now, you might ask, how does death glorify God? Well, it's the end of a successful mission. We've already seen how Jesus' purpose was to die. This is his success criteria. But it's also the portal to restoring his own glory when he rises from the dead and ascends to the Father. Jesus' aim was always to glorify God. And that is our purpose, to glorify God. Our culture says that we're here to be happy. We should do or think or feel what makes us happy, what makes us feel good. It's our journey, our development. It is all about us. It's narcissistic. It's worshipping ourselves. But instead, Jesus says, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. The Westminster Shorter Catechism, which is a very old training manual on becoming a Christian, states, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to joy, enjoy him forever. If we glorify, uh, start again, put my teeth back in. If we glorify God, then we will enjoy God. The way we, that's the way we've been made. If we don't glorify God, then no matter how beautiful or slim or rich we are, we won't truly enjoy our lives. Our passage then ends describing the victory Jesus will win. By putting Jesus on the cross, the world has signed its own death warrant. When Jesus was lifted up, he wasn't talking. We sing a lot about lifting Jesus high. But that phrase at the time didn't mean about singing about Jesus being in heaven and glorified. The phrase at the time mean, meant being lifted onto your cross. So when Jesus says that he will be lifted up, or he says, and when I've been lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Jesus was saying, if you want to see me, then you need to see me on the cross in agony, dying. This is when the world will be judged, when the devil will be cast out completely from God's presence, and when the world's people will be saved by me. We often hear the word atonement used, especially during Lent, and that is what the cross is. I think Shirley said it earlier. The eternal debt that we cannot pay has been paid by Jesus on the cross. It's as simple as that. So if we want to see Jesus, we need to see him on the cross. I need to see him on the cross. I'm going to conclude this morning with a story. It's called the parable of the pit, which John Maxwell gave in a message many, many years ago. And this, for me, sums up the cross. A man fell into a pit and couldn't get himself out. A subjective person came along and said, I feel for you down there. An objective person came along and said, it's logical that someone would fall into that pit. A Pharisee said, only bad people fall into a pit. Confucius said, if you'd have listened to me, you wouldn't be in the pit. Buddha said, your pit is only a state of mind. A realist said, now that's a pit. A scientist calculated the pressure necessary, pounds and square inches, to get him out of the pit. A geologist told him to appreciate and study the rock strata in the pit. An evolutionist said, you'll die in the pit so you can't produce any more pit-falling offspring. And the building control inspector asked, did you have a permit to dig that pit? <laughs> 
A professor gave him a, li a lecture on the elementary principles of the pit. A self-pitying person said, you haven't seen anything till you've seen my pit. An optimist said, things could get worse. A pessimist said, things are going to get worse. But Jesus saw the man in the pit, took him by the hand and lifted him out. And that is what Jesus has done by dying on the cross. He has paid the eternal debt that we cannot possibly pay. He has lifted us out of the pit. Let us pray. Father God, we thank, praise, and give you glory because you are a living and mighty God. We thank you that you hear the prayers of all your people and that you answer, sometimes in ways we can't see, sometimes in ways we can't even imagine. You are the Lord Almighty who at the beginning of time made everything. You are the God who flung stars into space. You created the sun and the moon, day and night, tides and seasons. And our lives too, Lord, have seasons. Your word tells us that to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. There is a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them all up. And here, Lord, in your church, we face a new season. We face a time of change, and change can cause anxiety, not knowing where we're going and what's happening. But without change, Lord, nothing grows. We pray for George and Gail as they move into retirement. We're all going to send them messages, send them good wishes. We hope, Lord, that they're happy and healthy and that this will be a fantastic time for them to move into new areas of life and find new fulfilment in different things. And we pray for Hazel and Lawrence and the rest of her family. We pray for her in her new post, that her gifts and talents will shine out for you. And Father God, we pray that here at St. Mary's and, and St. Chad's, the interregnum will be short, that those of us here will find the guidance energy and skill to fill the gaps in the meantime and Lord as a people of faith and as we continue to pray we trust that your hand is already on the person that you have chosen to lead us here in this church Father God we pray for the sorry state of our world we pray for all the innocent people who are dying needlessly because very powerful leaders have their own self-centered personal agendas we pray especially for all the children caught up in these wars and disasters who are losing their lives sometimes in horrific ways that we see on the news and we can't even imagine father those lives can never be restored to this earth their future hopes and dreams will never be realized and we pray for their families who've been deprived someone very precious Lord Jesus Christ Prince of Peace we pray that the work of all the peace seekers and peacemakers will be rewarded that evil will be confronted and that your kingdom of love and justice will prevail
Father God, we remember all those we know who are suffering at this time. We pray for the people whose names are written in the book of this, our church. We pray for every person who feels that they're unwanted or worthless. We pray for all those with a disability that they're struggling with, those who are ill, those who are old or frail and can no longer manage on their own. And we thank you for all the individuals in the NHS who are working so hard with limited time and resources to help people in desperate need. We pray for our paramedics and ambulance drivers who can't always help people in the way that they would wish because the system is struggling. We pray for all carers, whether they are family, friends, or paid people who support others in their own homes. Lord, bless these servants. Finally, we bring ourselves before you. We thank you that you love us without limit or conditions. When we're doing really well, when we're not very sensible, and when we're just plain miserable. We know that your hand is always upon us. We know that you care about the big things in our lives as well as the little things. And we know that you accept us and you use us just the way we are. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you all for those various parts of the service. Uh, before we do the piece, there's just something that I wanted to say that struck me while um, Kaz was talking. Now, when I'm leading a service, sometime a week before, I then choose all of the liturgy, the confession, the absolution, and the such like. <clears throat> and then on Sunday morning, I then look at it all, and work out what, if anything, I'm going to say about it before we say it. Now this morning, when I was looking at all of these things, the one thing that I noticed was each one that I've chosen was to do with the death of Jesus. And I thought, oh, I can't. I can't push that. But if you think about it, we started off, we were once dead, spiritually dead, and then the absolution spoke of the death of his son. The collect spoke of death and resurrection of the son. The peace speaks of shedding of Christ's blood. The post-communion prayer and died, Jesus died for us. And the blessing talks of the son who died for us. And I thought, well, I can't mention that because <laughs> it's possibly a bit negative. But it isn't. And obviously, I think it's something that we need to remember. Because of our faith, we have faith, we have salvation, we have eternal life. Because Jesus died for us. Anyway, I just thought I'd say that. I wasn't going to, but I just thought it links up, I think. And she hasn't hit me yet for doing it, so. Okay. Anyway, the peace. Once we were far off, but now in union with Christ Jesus, we have been brought near through the shedding of Christ's blood, for he is our peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace.
Everything in heaven and on earth is yours. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. Blessed be God who enthrones us with Christ in the heavenly realms. May we feed upon the bread of God and drink the royal wine of heaven. Blessed be God forever. Amen. The Lord is here. Is lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. For as the time of his passion and resurrection draws near, the whole world is called to acknowledge his hidden majesty. The power of the life-giving cross reveals the judgment that has come upon the world and the triumph of Christ crucified. He is the victim who dies no more, the lamb once slain who lives forever, our advocate in heaven to plead our cause, exalting us there to join with angels and archangels, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Granted by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. 
This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. You are the saviour of the world. And so, Father, calling to mind his death on the cross, his perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. As we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup, and we thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit on your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup, so that we, in the company of all the saints, may praise and glorify you forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. And so for those of you who are joining in it from home or wherever, an opportunity to ask God into your own lives. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits you have given me, for all the pains and insults you have borne for me. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I ask you to come spiritually into my heart. O most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen.
And the post-communion prayer. 
And from this I thought, why do we have forgiveness, salvation, eternal life? So we can serve. Lord Jesus Christ, you have taught us that what we do for the least of our brothers and sisters, we also do for you. Give us the will to be the servants of others, as you were the servant of all, and gave up your life and died for us, but are alive and reign now and forever. And we say together, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of the Spirit to live and serve to your praise and glory. Amen. Four very quick things. Tea, coffee, squash, biscuits at the back. They're getting ready at this very moment. Um, there is prayer ministry in the Lady Chapel there. For if you feel the need, you want someone to pray confidentially with you, there will be two people there. Don't forget the electoral roll. And also, um, Mary Ortiz is away this weekend because she's gone on a Youth for Christ weekend. So let us hope that uh, she's learnt a lot and gained from it. So that was uh, Mary. And so we come to the final song. Please stand if you're able. Lord, I come before your throne of grace. I find rest in your presence and fullness of joy. In worship and in wonder I behold your face. Singing what a faithful God have I. What a faithful God have I. What a faithful God. of God Almighty, the Father who made us, the Son who died for us, and the Holy Spirit who works in us, be upon us all and upon this church today and always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. What a faithful God have I, what a faithful God, what a faithful God.
Faithful.